from the 37th parallel on America's haunted highway, it's Pixelated Paranormal, your guide to the unusual and the strange. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Pixelated Paranormal. I think this is episode 244, and that means it must be part two of our ongoing series about the monsters that are stalking us in the woods. Mm -hmm. And last, yeah, last time, man, you kind of got us warmed up a little bit with the Mantis Man. But as cool and as vague as it was, I'm really excited for this episode about the deer people. Because I think as lame as the name sounds, it's got a hell of a lot of great folklore behind it and sounds pretty terrifying. Yeah. Now, before we get into it, uh, anything fun or exciting you want to say at the top? Uh, well, I mean, you and I have been uh, playing um, Shredder's Revenge um, on the Xbox, and then... Um, it's normally it's it's not my you know this is not my weekend with my son so I, I get the I get the kids every other weekend and um, so uh, Thursday or Friday um, I took my uh, stepdaughter out for sushi so we could have a little you know dinner date because um, I wasn't gonna have her this weekend and then my son called me he's like oh I guess mom said that you can pick me up if you want and I'm like well. I mean, I don't get off till five, so as long as she's cool with me picking you up at five, like hell yeah, buddy, I'll come pick your ass up. And so I got him when I got <laughs> got off work today. He's like, "What are we gonna do, Dad?" And I'm like, "Well, let me introduce you to a little gem from my childhood." And we just fucking went to town on that game, and he's really enjoying it. And then I'm like, "Well." I did go ahead and buy the first two seasons of the original animated series from the 90s. Well, when you get done recording your show, we're going to have to watch it. And I'm like, I think we shall. I think we shall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. So you're going to watch that tonight then after we get done recording, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, buddy, um, I am just proud to say that I started my niece off today reading Goosebumps by R.L. Stein, And I just dropped off the very first one, part one, Welcome to the Dead House. So my only complaint about that is, <laughs> um, you know, as, as a child, I read every single, like, Goosebumps that, you know, was imaginable that was out there. Um, mm -hmm. Every time we had a book fair, like, you bet your bottom dollar, uh, I had a Goosebumps book, read them all. I think my favorite one was the one where you had, like, the kids who spent, like, the their summer vacation, like, with their grandparents up in Maine, but then, like, ended up, like, there was, like, ghosts in the house, and everybody was, like, dead the whole entire time. I don't remember the exact plot, but I just remember, like, just binging that book in, like, a day. Like, Dad was like, are you yeah. going to come out of your room? I'm like, fuck off, old man, it's intense. <laughs> I got to finish. Um, fuck off, Dad, I'm 25 and I can do what I want. Yeah. And then um, Dad uh, went down to the Wichita Public Library, you know, Friends of the Used Bookstore, and they had a R.L. Stein book called, like, Superstition, but it was huh. R.L. Stein for adults. And so I'm thinking, like, fuck yeah, and then I cracked that, cracked that book open. I'm like, holy shit, like, this guy is more overtly sexual than Stephen King went, <laughs> like, graphically about it. And I'm like, oh, God, like, any kid that gets hooked on R.L. Stein, like, just, you know what? It stops at goosebumps, kids. Uh, he doesn't make books for <laughs> adults. Just yeah. don't ever Boners are already that. awkward enough. We don't need to add any more to it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Now, was it like a Fear Street series, or was it something like even more adult than that? It was uh, more adult than that. Because, like, Fear Street was kind of like young adult, like, you know, late teen. Like, this was like okay. hardcore, like, 20 year old, like, horror smut stuff. And, like, he wrote a couple Ooh. of them. They're really, uh -huh. they're really good. And you're like, holy shit, this guy's like worse than Stephen King when it comes to, like, graphic and details and gore. But at the same time, like, you just, you're mind blown because it's like, dude, I read this guy's books when I was a kid. Like, how do you go from point A to point B? <laughs> dude, that's funny. Yeah, I read quite a few of his Fear Street. I have Goosebumps 1 through 55, and then I need to jump on eBay and see if I can find 56 through, I think, 62 is where it capped off. 
before the original series stopped. But yeah, my niece is going to start reading those one by one. And she told me that she wants to start with the first one and work her way up chronologically. So what we're going to do is she will read it. And then when she's done, I will, I mean, probably kill it off in like an hour and then do like a little book club where she wants to fill out these worksheets she had in school and, you know, compare and contrast the different stories with each other to see what kind of like, you know, tropes are similar in all the books. What's their, what are different. It's going to be pretty fun. Yeah. I like that. Hell yeah. And I mean, we didn't mean for this to be R.L. Stein um, hour, but I just saw in the news the other day, he is going to be releasing a four part series of comic books called R.L. Stein's Stuff of Nightmares 1 through 4. And apparently this is supposed to be the Stuff of Nightmares, and it's going to be a very mature R.L. Stein retelling, like, um, Frankenstein and some other stuff. Oh, it'll it's be mature. To... I, can, I, can, I can bet you that. <laughs> on, on the stuff that I read, it'll be mature. <laughs> Flashback to your nocturnal emissions, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's supposed to be a lot more mature than the Fear Street novel, so maybe it's going to be closer to what you were just talking about. But, yeah, it'll be a four-part series kicking off in September. And I want to say Boom is the production company who are making these, if I remember right. Yeah, Boom Studios. They just did a series called Berserker that was co-created by Keanu Reeves. But, yeah, the publisher will be releasing a four-part series from R.L. Stein, and I couldn't be more excited. Well, I guess that concludes the news section. Let's just jump into it, buddy. When we last left off, you were trying to keep us out of the woods by telling us stories of the Mantis Man. What do you have for tonight's episode? Well, for this episode, we once again crack open Bodies in the Woods. Report number four, which we will get towards the end, inspired me to dig a little deeper and look into a possible cryptid encounter we haven't covered before. Now... Normally, these cryptid encounters are a little one-sided. Goatman, Mothman, Mantis Man, Frogmen. So tonight, it's not all about Deer Man. This one is for the ladies, too. And as they say, ladies first. So, <laughs> Deer Women, sometimes known as Deer Ladies, are shape-shifting women in Native American mythology. They can be found in and around Oklahoma, the western United States, and the Pacific Northwest. They allegedly appear at various times as a human woman, a young, beautiful maiden, ooh la la, or a deer, Mm. which is kind of lame. But some descriptions (laughs) assign her a human female upper body and the lower body of a white-tailed deer. So they're kind of like sultry minotaurs. Yeah. The deer women have been seen as beautiful women just off the trail or behind a bush, calling to travelers, leading some to draw comparisons with the nymphs of classical mythology. Right. And I mean, I guess it wouldn't be a minotaur. It'd be more like a satyr, kind of like Pan, like a little goat yeah. person, deer yeah. person. Yeah. When I, like a, when I like first sex- read this... Like a sexy pan, like, oh, yeah, like a play sex me your pan. flute, baby. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you remember whenever we volunteered that year for uh, Tough Mudder, tearing down the obstacle course, and we had that guy named Pan that was yes. like, a, like a mountain man? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, apropos of nothing there, but that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I guess um, when I first read this, I was picturing them as like a four-legged deer person with like, you know, a female torso and arms and a face and a deer body. But no, further reading proved that I was very wrong. <laughs> wah, wah. But what's, yeah, but I mean, these are a lot like, you know, your classic sirens from, you know, nautical mythology, a lot like Medusa and Greek mythology where we've just got these sultry female monsters that are luring men to their death. And then you've got, you know, it's very akin to the succubus in medieval and Christian mythology and even Lilith from the Mesopotamian, you know, Judaic mythology or maybe more popular from the Bible. Um, You can also read more about her or rather hear more about her in our Thieves in the Night episode one. Mm, Yeah. But basically, we've always demonized women into being just, you know, sexy she demons. Mm, Yeah. A deer woman is often said to have all the features of a normal young woman, except she has hooves instead of human feet and eyes similar to those of a deer. 
Men who are lured into the presence of a dear woman often notice too late that it is not a normal lady that they are being lured by. <laughs> but, they realize too late they've got a yeah. boner and she has a deer body. Yep. But before they can get away, the deer woman stomps them to death. Other mm. stories and traditions describe the sighting of deer women to be a sign of personal transformation or a warning. Dear women are also said to be uh, fond of dancing and will sometimes join a communal dance unnoticed, leaving only when the drum beating ceases. And leaving behind them hoof prints in the dirt. Tales of dear women have been told by many different Native American tribes for as long as anyone can remember. Different tribes have different versions of the story, but generally it goes that the dear woman appears to hunters who are out alone, especially... When a hunter is tired or things are not going well. Her lodge will mysteriously show up nearby. She will walk out of the lodge and the hunter will see that she is the most beautiful woman he's ever laid eyes on. Then she'll smile understandingly and invite the hunter inside of her lodge to warm up by the fire and drink the tea. Drink some tea and maybe a little more. You know what's, uh, I just now realized that... This is very similar to that yokai that we covered in the yokai episode where they'd be traveling, you know, down the mountainside or whatever. They'd be out in the wilderness Mm -hmm. and this, like, hut would pull up and there'd be, like, this, well, not always a sexy lady. Sometimes it was an old, (laughs) older gal, but they'd be like, oh, come on in, boys, and have some tea. And then, like, they'd get all sleepy and then they, like, wake up and she'd transform into, like, hideous demon. And she'd be like, ah, <laughs> licking off their face. And the guy's like, no, Jerry, why couldn't yep. it have been me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like I say, dude, in all sorts of mythology, I forgot about the yokai stories. But yeah, we always just tell these, you know, warning tales about women monsters just luring us in and then, you know, murdering us or, you know, being impregnated by humans to carry on yeah. hybrids and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, basically, we've just demonized women for the last, you know, hundred that decades. Is it de- uh, demonizing women or is it the fact that we know as men... We think with our penises, and so these are mythologies built in. Like, guys, don't always think with your penis, okay? You come across the, you know, a hut out in the middle of the woods for a little ooh-la-la, you need to think about that for a second because it could be a demon deer lady, and she's going to stomp you to death. So, I mean, it could just be, you know, the other way around where men are just pigs, and we're, we're trying to teach ourselves to be better. So you're saying that it's actually our own wanton ways and our own fantasies where we secretly wish there was a half woman, half deer that we could bang in some weird hut? Yeah. I think you might be, you might be onto something, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> you might be onto something. So this, the tale goes if the hunter stays the night at a deer woman's lodge, he will never be the same. He wakes up. Uh, when he wakes up, he will be lying alone in the field. No trace of the lodge or the deer woman to be found. Those are called one night stands. But what do I know? <laughs> but he has changed. In his mind, he is now obsessed with the dear woman, and his whole being is bent on finding her again. He forgets his family, he forgets his friends, and he even forgets himself. Such a man goes looking for her. He tells himself that he must find her. But what he's really looking for is his spirit because she's secretly taken it away from him. Just like uh, when you eat uh, or drink uh, food from the fairies. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. I was actually thinking that earlier when I was reading this document uh, this document about the uh, thieves in the night and all those stories about the fae folk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, now he's forever restless. If a man can see the dear woman and turn away from her, though... He will gain new strength and good luck. He will be different than that of his peers and rise above them. According to the Oibe tradition, they can be banished through the use of tobacco and chanting. Ojibwe. (laughs) Ojibwe. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. According to the Ojibwe tradition, they can be banished through the use of tobacco and chanting. Others say that you can break their spell by looking at their feet and realizing that they're hooves. And once they are recognized for what they are... The dear women run away. Dear women are thought to be an allegory about attempting to know and understand uh, someone you're attempting to get sexually intimate with. 
about Ooh. how, yeah, about how it's important to see someone as they truly are, not as you wish them to be. But what about dear women's stories from modern times? Dear women's stories are still going despite the changing times. Instead of a mysterious lodge appearing in hunting grounds, dear women can be a hitchhiker on the side of the road or sitting in a corner at a bar or a gorgeous stranger at a powwow. The dear woman shares a deeper connection to the folklore from across the globe. For example, from other regions such as La Llorona from Mexico and the southwestern United States, the Fiora of Chile, the Colombian creatures known as the Patasola, and the Tundra and the Lara of Brazil, the Zana from Spain, the Nag Canyas, the Serpent Lady from India, they're all females who at times function as sirens, leading men to their deaths. In Scottish folklore, the Bobahan Sith is a female vampire said to have goat legs who seduces travelers and then feasts on their blood. The physical deformity marking the otherwise perfect woman is a common theme among legendary siren-like figures. Well, dear women have hooves for feet. La Patasola and the Tunda have deformed feet like La Yaronia, who is often said to have no feet by those who see her. The Lara, on the other hand, is a fish woman with a blowhole in her neck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. In parts of, <laughs> in parts of North India, there have been reports of people shocked, generally at night, by suddenly discovering that they're to, the, to their utter surprise that the women traveling along them have cow hooves instead of normal feet. In other versions of this urban legend, women have normal feet, but fixed in other ways around. I think uh, maybe... Uh, <clears throat> after oh, we get... sorry. But fixed the other way around. Sorry. I think uh, after this uh, series, we should... Uh, what was the, the, Indi uh, the India one? The... Nag Kanyas, like, I mm -hmm. think I want to cover cow ladies. <laughs> I actually have that bookmark on my Safari tab right now on my phone. <laughs> oh, goody, goody. We'll have to get yeah. to that. And remember, dear listeners, she will be incredibly and hypnotically beautiful. Kind of mm -hmm. like Jennifer, Gar uh, was it, uh, not, uh, Jennifer Aniston, right? Think Jennifer Aniston with deer hooves. And the only way to tell that it is her is to look closely at her feet. I knew a guy that said he had gone to a powwow, and there was a girl he met there, and he was supposed to take her home. And he actually decided at the last minute he wasn't going to, and so he ditched her, and he left the powwow. And then when he was driving home from the powwow later on that night, and this is a true story, mind you, when he was driving home from the powwow that night, a deer went in front of his car, causing him to wreck, and it totaled his vehicle. The accident happened around 1979 or 1980, when he was about 16 years old. Well, he actually had a girlfriend at the time, and that's why he initially decided against bringing the girl home with him. You cheating son of a bitch. <laughs> Henry's a real honest type of person, so if he had totaled his truck after a powwow just because he was drunk or something like that, he'd tell everybody that. I think the dear woman could have sensed that he was having adulterous thoughts, and that's why she went after him. Ooh. Now, you, you had read all this from Bodies in the Woods, and I actually have a book here that I pull a lot of our stories from. It's by Linda S. Godfrey, and again, it's called I Know What I Saw, Modern Day Encounters with Monsters of New Urban Legend and Ancient Lore. It is a mouthful. Uh, we could probably do episodes just about Linda S. Godfrey alone. She's written, gosh, somewhere close to like 20-some books. She's been on Coast to Coast. Um, just one hell of an author with lots of great stories. But in this book, there's actually a chapter devoted towards... Those dear, dear people. In a section called The Oglala Deer Woman, she writes, and I'm going I'm to read this straight from the book here. The idea of monsters with feminine attributes is not so isolated of a concept, either in mythology being Greek or that of the Bible. 
In 2009, Patrick encountered a creature with a very human female torso, but an animal structure from the waist down. Patrick goes on to say in a letter he wrote, Have you heard of the deer people, like the deer woman or the deer man? I have a strange encounter to relate to you. I live in Rapid City, South Dakota, and I am an enrolled member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe and often travel to the reservation. This happened three years ago when it was late at night. I was traveling with a former acquaintance, and we were about 15 miles from the town of Hermosa, and it was pitch black and really dark outside. I was asleep in the passenger seat when my traveling partner woke me up, saying he just passed a pretty nice-looking woman standing in the tall grass near the edge of the road. He was wondering if we should pick her up. I've heard stories from my late mother about picking up hitchhikers late at night near the reservation. And she told me the shapeshifters and other less savory supernatural entities like goat men and dog men and deer people. So I told him just to drive on. If there was a woman standing there at two in the morning, she could find her own way home. Well, a couple minutes passed and then he said, there she is. And he was pointing to the side of the road, and there was a female figure standing there, but I couldn't necessarily see her legs. I told him to keep driving and put some oomph in the gas pedal. We were nearing a part of Battle Creek when he said, There she is again! Except this time he had a slight twinge of fear in his voice. And I looked, and sure enough, she was standing out on the pavement. She was wearing a dress-tight piece of clothing and had small hooves where her feet should have been. She had a human upper body, long, dark hair, but her eyes, her eyes reflected white in the headlights. She had a pretty face, kind of like a Disney version of Pocahontas, maybe around 5'9 and about 120 pounds. We didn't really get a good look at her legs the first time, but the sighting a few miles later showed she definitely had deer legs and possibly even a tail. She had the same markings of a mule deer, and she had human hands for sure. He hit the gas pedal, and I looked behind us, and then there were vaguely shaped deer-like figures running not far behind our Tahoe. We were going like 80 miles an hour on a small two-lane country highway. The road is very curvy and had lots of blind spots. We got to Hermosa and hid out at a truck stop for a couple hours. It was very unnerving and really strange. And I now don't go near that reservation at night or even during the evening. It also felt like I was seeing things for quite a while. So according to Patrick, he and his friends are not the only people to have seen what is more accurately known as the Mule Deer Woman. He also added, A lot of people tell stories about encountering her between the months of June and November, a lot of times during powwows and other ceremonial gatherings. She's like the boogeyman to us, like a succubus. She'll entice men away from crowds, and then they're never seen again. Or if they are found, the bodies are discovered trampled to death. There's even some reports of survivors in other tribes and other reservations. So that kind of concludes our side of the female deer people. And Preston, you've got a pretty big write-up here on the male counterpart. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about deer men. Deer Man is a cryptid whose legend originates in the folklore of North America. Sightings of the Deer Man have been reported from several U.S. states, although there is some variation in the description given. A hybrid animal. Deer Man has the antler head of a great stag, a human torso, and the legs described as similar to either those of a man or a deer. In addition, it is usually said to be well-muscled and surprisingly fast for its size. Other accounts gift the beast with the powers to transform itself from a regular deer to the form described above. Sounds like old boy's got some thick thighs. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> it's like Superman Pan. Superman Pan. 
Well, if I could yet again add something that I came across to. Yeah. We started off the notion of the episode that we have all sorts of weird monster men running around, right? It's like uh, that time we, uh, what, what did we do that show that was like the Frogman, Goatman, and we uh, intro with, it's raining, man. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> yeah. We're getting about a part yeah, two. Yeah, we, yeah, we had Frogman and Dogman and Goatman. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I mean, that seems to kind of be the repeated pattern here, right? We've got Bigfoot, Goatman, Mothman, Frogman, Dogman, and now, you know, Deer Man and Deer People. And like we talked about during Thieves in the Night series, again, I'll mention that, while these creatures seem to be more terrestrial in nature, albeit possibly fallen angels or even the Nephilim, while I was reading up on Deer People, I came across something kind of interesting. Now, before you mentioned the Ojibwe people earlier and their folklore about the deer people, so I dug a little deeper during our little break from last night to tonight and found this. Maybe perhaps deer people are actually extraterrestrial rather than the cryptid. There's a pretty common tale from an Ojibwe encounter. It talks about a man named Eshkekbug. Now, I don't have the proper dates, but it's fair to say this one is one of those stories that falls into the folklore category because it's more of an origin tale. So one day, old Eshkekbug was out and about when he noticed brightly colored sky craft that he described as being the shape of a clamshell, but a shiny, multicolored metallic material like that of the rainbow. The craft slowly lowered down onto the ground on top of a hill, and then suddenly, one by one, he watched as ten of the most beautiful women he'd ever laid eyes on, walked out of the craft, and then began to run and jump and tumble all around the grass on the top of the hill. Shortly after the women had all appeared and begun to frolic around the strange craft, he said then a man appeared, who had broad shoulders and the head of a great deer. He walked among the frolicking women and soon approached Eshkekbug from the moon and that he would give Eshkekbug the hand of any one of the beautiful women, which would then give him the power to change into any animal form that he would desire, as well as trees. After the exchange, the nine other women began to sing, and oddly, this song seemed to power their clam saucer, And together, the man with the deer head and the other nine ladies climbed back inside the strange saucer, which then raised up and flew off into the sky, leaving behind a strange burnt circle of charred grass where it landed on top of the hill. So then Eshkek Bug was then wed to one of the moon clam ladies, and soon after they had a child together, a boy they named Blue Sky who is said to be abnormally tall for a human, which is very similar to that of the giants from the Bible, right? This is supposedly what happened when the sons of God laid with the daughters of man, and we get these weird giants, or again, the Nephilim. Sadly, though, as Eshkek Bug was still technically a mortal of Earth, he would succumb to old age, whereas time, though, seemed to have no effect on his wife. So, bizarrely, the deer man has ties to UFOs and flying saucers, as well as some cryptid roots as well. But anyway, buddy, sorry to grab the wheel there. Let's get back on to some deer man encounters. Yes, sir. An unnamed 14-year-old witness was playing at his cousin's house near the sunset when he spotted a creature emerging from the bush. And his report said, It was getting dark and I was the one searching. I heard leaves crumpling and then I turned to look and I saw what looked like a deer on its hind legs. I clearly remember seeing dog legs that were running, but the rest of the body was straight up. It ran with incredible speed and I knew it wasn't either one of my cousins who was hiding. I ran as fast as I could back to the house and one of my cousins was running too. He saw the same thing. It still creeps me out to this day because my uncle had always told us how he had saw weird things on that property as well. Hoskin, Delaware, 1993. 
Another account from at the time eight-year-old eyewitness who was staying with his grandparents at their home in the Woodland States goes on to say, It was right there, like almost pressed against the window in profile. I stared in awe. And then that is when it changed. In one smooth movement, it reared up on hind legs, and it was no longer a deer, but a man. There were only two men in this area, my grandfather and my dad, and it was clearly neither one of them. I'm not sure if that made it better or worse. Grandfather was built for his age, and dad had a gut. But this silhouette was clearly younger, more muscular, and not in the like a brick the way my grandfather was built. It exuded strength and scared the hell out of me. It stared to the side for a moment and then strode off with purpose. Looking back, I want to tell myself it was just an imagination of a half-awake child, but I remember the awe and the utter fear I felt when the deer had changed. And for all you uh, youngins out there, uh, when uh, he was saying my grandfather was built like a brick, uh, that actual phrase is built like a brick shithouse. (laughs) That means he was a solid old fucker. Yeah, a lot of these old timers were built like refrigerators, man. Just big old burly guys, yeah. barrel shaped chests, and hands that could crack walnuts. There you go. From and the farts that could clear out a barn. <laughs> From the Wichita <laughs> Mountains National Wildlife Refuge in Oklahoma, 2012. In this report, a man named Kyle Hain was out with his friend photographing the night sky when a number of wild animals, including both elk and bison, rushed past giving off the impression that they were attempting to escape from something lurking in the nearby forest. Subsequently, a, a deathly science, or silence descended across the landscape. Decidedly unsettled by the turn of events, the men packed up their gear and began to retreat to their vehicle when a sudden rustling in the long grass caused them to bring their rifles to bear. Reaching their vehicle, Hang and his companion were about to drive off when a deer man emerged from the shadows and began to lurch towards them. The two men hit the accelerator and sped off as fast as they could manage. Commenting on the encounter, Hang said the following. We were scared shitless. Things got even quieter when we stayed there. While there, we heard one ear-piecing screech or scream almost a hunting screech of some sort that made my hair stand on end and gave me goosebumps even worse. With that, we left the mountains completely. We felt as though we were not wanted there that night. The way the wildlife acted, the figure that we came across that the animals had to have ran from, and then that scream of which I can only find reference to, which happens to be the Banshee. I can't forget that figure we saw either, as well as that scream. It was not human, but it was not any of the wildlife I'm familiar with from that area either. So it almost sounds like these things can go from like cute and sexy like the mule deer woman or deer women to something more sinister. And here's another story that I found from April 6, 2018 that happened in Colorado Springs. A man and his girlfriend were driving, looking for a place to eat near Colorado Springs one night during a misty, light snowstorm. They weren't having any luck finding a restaurant, but they both felt compelled to keep looking despite the growing fear that something might be wrong. They were debating about turning back when they noticed ahead six or more deer running on a hill to the right side of their car. Now nearby was a fence with what looked like a limp dead deer carcass hanging across it. They also discovered a restaurant was just ahead. The man would go on to report, As we pulled up, we saw them, the deer people. That's really the only way I know to describe them. There were about a dozen scattered across the area in front of us. They appeared to be about six feet tall, or maybe just a few inches under. Standing upright with their thin waists and legs, but they looked somewhat human-like. 
But the strange part is their upper bodies, which had wide shoulders, wide necks, and heads that almost looked to be too big for their bodies. All of them were covered in fur, but their faces, however, resembled those of a deer. Their eyes were wide set and black, and they had large ears, and a couple of them even had what looked like antlers. Now he and his girlfriend both saw these creatures, and the man said they seemed fully physical to him, but his girlfriend mentioned she thought they might have been phasing in and out of existence. Now, the writer goes on to leave out whether or not they stayed at the restaurant to eat or not, but one of the creatures may have possibly followed the couple home. The next night, as he lay in bed, he heard footsteps and heavy breathing, and when he looked over, he saw a tall shadow in the corner of his room. Not long after that, he was smoking on his apartment balcony when he saw a large figure standing in a nearby riverbank staring up at him on his balcony. He had the same oversized head, thick neck and broad shoulders, and a deer-like muzzle similar to the creatures they had seen before while driving through Colorado Springs. He ran to get his girlfriend to witness the creature too, but by the time he got her out on the balcony, the strange creature had disappeared. Dun dun dun! (laughs) I know, fucking creepy shit, right? And now for the story that started me down this rabbit hole. Report number four from Bodies in the Woods. Hello all, I'm Eddie. And a weird thing happened when I was just a little guy, about 12 years old. It's something I think about frequently. I was on my second deer hunting trip with my Uncle Mike, somewhere in Dodge County. It wasn't long after we began our hike into the woods that we came across a scary scene. I don't know how else to put it other than to say it was a gang of bucks and they were terrorizing and beating another human hunter. We were pretty far away, but when we first spotted the mayhem, my uncle couldn't do much about it. He commanded of me before we set down the gradual hill to the edge of the woods where the brutal action was unfolding, his rifle ready. Stay put, Eddie. By the time my uncle got within range to attempt to intervene, the other hunter had gone limp. He was severely beaten after being impaled several times. Even while his body lay lifeless, the angry deer continued to trample him. When my uncle Mike shot his rifle into the air, the deer stopped what they were doing and just stared up at him but not a single one of them ran off right away. The group looked like they were considering charging in his direction, but then he fired off another two shots towards the sky, and they all concluded that it might not be worth the risk and slowly turned around. But that was when things got even weirder, much weirder. The bucks had begun to walk away off into the nearby woods, but one of them turned around, snatched the dead hunter's arm, and drug him into the woods with what looked like minimal effort. My Uncle Mike hollered just before firing off another shot into the air. Hey, you sons of bitches. His voice indicated that he couldn't believe what he had just saw even more than I did. The guy had to have been wondering whether he was losing his mind. We didn't see the bucks again after that, When my uncle arrived at my side, we walked straight back to his truck. He kept his rifle ready and his head on a swivel throughout the entire walk. He also asked me not to talk until he made it inside of his vehicle. I can't express how frightened I was, thinking those psycho bucks could jump out at us at any given moment. Fortunately, we were able to drive out of there without any trouble. If you want to know my theory about those bucks, I don't think they were deer. I think they were demons. There's just no way a regular deer would drag a man back into the woods with his jaws. I can't be sure, but something about that herd of bucks indicated that they took the guy to a place where they could then devour him without any interference from my Uncle Mike or anybody else. But why would demonic spirits want to possess herbivores like that? 
what would the purpose be for taking over the bodies of deer rather than something equipped with claws and carnivorous teeth? This mystery will almost certainly remain unsolved, but I know one thing. Humans are never as safe as they think while trekking through the great outdoors. Mm. So what mm -hmm. in the actual fuck are we dealing with from all the above encounters? One of the most popular ideas is that uh, these are examples of what we call skinwalkers, shape-changing entities mostly known through the lore of the Navajo Native Americans who called them the Yi Nadlushi, which translates to he who goes on all fours. They are typically described as having once been powerful witches or medicine uh, men who through a magical means, vary from tradition to tradition, acquired various supernatural powers. Chief among them the ability to shape shift into various animals forms such as coyotes, crows, wolves, bears, cougars, owls, and other animals including deer, as well as half-human abominations that merge the features of an animal and a man. They are also said to be extremely fast, strong, and agile, and have an assortment of other powers, such as the ability to mesmerize, instill supernatural fear, read minds, sound confusion, and possess the bodies of others for a short duration. They are usually described as being rather animalistic looking, even in human form, and are often naked, but not always, and are generally seen as being almost impossible to kill with one of the only ways uh, is to use a bullet or a knife covered in a special white ash. The most common method for becoming a skinwalker is said to be for the medicine man or witch to bring a dark curse upon themselves by performing rituals and rites of pure evil. Kind of like Anakin Skywalker killing all the younglings in Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, that's the ultimate evil right there. Thus, they would be imbued with the powers of the dark side. And in addition to gruesome rituals, uh, are said to be required to commit great atrocities, grotesqueries, and grave taboos, often including the murder of loved ones and other horrific acts. If all of it is done correctly, they are infused with the insidious curse and all of the sinister's powers that come with it. This most often results in the newly minted skinwalker being banished from the tribe, after which they wander the wilderness, stalking and tormenting anyone they come across, feeding off the fear they conjure in those who look upon them. They are in a sense cursed to walk the barren badlands forever, and they are at once both evil monsters and tragic figures. Well, I'm glad you added that little bit there about the skinwalker because I found one more story that sounded pretty strange. But then as soon as I read the rest of the notes and you mentioned skinwalker, it all kind of makes sense. It all kind of fits together, although with a little bit of a twist. Ooh, I got you down the rabbit hole too. Yeah, buddy. I mean, honestly, the book that you got, Bodies in the Woods, and then this book, I Know What I Saw, from Linda Godfrey, Linda S. Godfrey, uh, man, we should have really like just spent like two weeks researching because there's so much more we haven't really talked about. And I don't want to do the whole like, dear people part two. <laughs> right. You know, but uh, I mean, maybe that'll prompt some listeners to do a little more digging and do your own research. Or make a song, Isaac. <laughs> right. Well, the last story here comes from a guy who lives in East Liverpool, Ohio, not to be confused with the UK. Oh, and my dog's hungry, speaking of carnivorous beasts. <laughs> this guy's name is Dale, and he says, I was living in East Liverpool, Ohio back in 1998. I lived at the top of the Calcutta Smith Ferry Hill. Now, the hill's fairly steep, and in the winter, it can be most treacherous to climb, and worse when you're going back down. So you always want to take it easy anywhere you're at on that road. Now I worked the night shift and often did not head home until after 3 a.m. most nights. I can't recall exactly what night it was that this occurred, but I know it was the tail end of November going on into December. I've been working and was getting sick that night. And as the night went on, I just got sicker and sicker to the point where I had to leave and go home early. 
Now, it had been really snowing earlier that day, and the roads were just covered with ice. I believe it was about 1.30 in the morning that I started up the Calcutta Smith Ferry Road. The snow made it really rough to get up, and I was really taking it slow. And as I went up the hill, I can't recall if it was a full moon or not, but I remember it was really clear, and the moon was seriously shining. And with all the white snow and the ice, it really lit up the area at night, and I could see pretty well. Now as I cleared the crest of the hill and started down the other side, I had to really take it slowly as I started to slide sideways. Soon the rear of my car started to pull to my left, which edged my car slightly to face the right into a farmer's field. Now as I was sliding, I managed to get the car back under control without any kind of serious crash. But as I took notice that my car was sliding, I saw a family of four deer come out of the woods from the Beaver Creek. But what struck me as being odd is that when they came out, they started running towards my car instead of away. I thought it was weird that they were moving so fast too, just full tilt. But I put my attention back on the road as I was starting to slide again. My car actually went into a full 360 spin. I got myself collected and found myself facing towards the field again. As I set back up, I saw the deer stop about 300 feet away. Now, up until now, I didn't have any idea that anything was really weird, but then two of the deer stood up, and suddenly I could see they were no longer deer. Instead, it looked like they were really weird-looking wolves. I'd say they stood up about six feet high, and I remember their eyes were a strange green color. Now, deer eyes, if I remember correctly, glow red with eye shine. So yeah, I panicked, I got back on the road, and took off like a shot. And surprisingly, these creatures followed me, running on all fours for roughly 200 yards. After that, I stopped watching them, I made it home about a minute later, and I ran into the house. After I got in, I told myself that I was sick and I must have just simply been seeing things, but I don't believe any of that now. The creatures varied in size. The largest two were the ones that stood up on their hind legs. The others were thinner and could have easily passed for does from a distance. But the larger ones were definitely broader and more wolf-like instead of deer. I know the primary one was male, but I'm not sure about the others. Their hands, the two that were standing on their hind feet, now that I think of it, were less human and more like the extended or lengthened canine paws. I would say they ran like dogs do because I really thought they were deer up until I looked right at them. Had they run differently, I might have thought to take note faster, but I believe they were just simply deer. And in the moonlight, they looked to me to be brown. But color can be tricky in the moonlight. One thing I also recall is that I believe they ran out of the woods with their tails down, not up like they normally do when they're chasing something. But when they came in front of the car, their tails were definitely in the air, which made it easier to believe that I was in a fever dream state. But the one that stood closest to my vehicle had his tail out and it was bristled. I can even remember seeing his breath backlit by the moonlight. Honestly, I can't recall how long they followed the car because I was more concerned about getting away than anything else. So, I don't know, man. Maybe there's more to it and this whole deer people thing could be more of a skinwalker in actuality. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to deep dive some more to like the lore behind skinwalkers because... You know, a lot of traditional Native American folklore is that uh, they're, you know, like a medicine man or like, you know, like a witch that have performed a curse. But then there are also like other tales where they're described more as like interdimensional beings. So there's something that have crossed over that don't belong here. And Mm -hmm. because they're in this dimension, they have to take the form of something. So it's like, you know, kind of like Pennywise, like, what am I going to take the form of? 
And so they end <laughs> right. up being this, you know, meld of human slash animal, but they they have evil intentions. Yep. Oh, yeah. I think you're onto something there, man. Yeah. It almost reminds me, too, of the Wendigo. Yeah. You know, because the Wendigo itself is said to have giant horns like a stag. And, I mean, a lot of this folklore is predominantly North American, you know, up in Canada, down in the States. And the majority of all this folklore comes from Native American tribes. So... You know, it kind of runs hand in hand with the Wendigo as well, saying that you could potentially see them possessing other humans for short terms. I don't know. It could just be a simple amalgam of several different folklore, or we could be dealing, uh, dealing with some, you know, unique creatures, man. We but, call them deer people. Maybe they're... So we we look at... Okay, so the Native American side of it, they're called skinwalkers, right? And so you get like yeah. we're almost like a werewolf type creature, but then you go to the European side of it and there I mean there are tales of like a tribe of dog people that we've covered or you get the folklore of werewolves. And so the Native American side, it's you have to have a special knife with white covered ash, and the European side you have to have a silver bullet. Ah, I see. Yeah. yeah. Are we dealing with the same entity? And it's just because, you know, the tradition on the European side, it was a curse and, you know, the full moon. But then the Native American side, it's also a curse, but it's only like medicine men and witches. But they're still describing the same creature. So you look at the characteristics of um, a Wendigo. And it has to do with, you know, gluttony. So it, 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 it hungers for death. And, you know, the only way that it's like a beast that you have to curb its appetite. So it, it, it's constantly wanting to kill and eat. But then look at the vampire. The vampire is very similar. It's a creature that mm-hmm. has this appetite that only blood um, can suffice it. So the, here's this folklore, this creature that drinks blood and it's constantly, you know, just this hunger, this thirst. Kind of the same description, but on one side of the ocean, it's got teeth and it can only come out at night. It's a curse. <laughs> but then you go to the Native American folklore, and now you have this creature that uh, it's a curse, and um, you know it likes to eat and kill things. So I, you know it could be that we're just dealing with uh, the same thing, whatever it is. It's just how it's described. It's just different from culture to culture. I think no matter how you slice it, though. They're all predominantly spawning from cautionary tales. You know, you have the Wendigo that tells you to keep away from gluttony. Don't eat humans, but also don't just be a little piggy and just eat everything in sight. You know, save some for tomorrow, save some for your family and friends. And when it comes to the mule deer woman or, you know, the the deer women, it's a cautionary tale about staying true. You know, don't go out, don't be adulterous, don't go to parties, whether you have a girlfriend or a wife at home, and then try to take the pretty girl off to the woods for a little nookie nookie, you know. Don't do that, because if you do that, she's going to be a half deer, half woman, and she's going to bang your brains out and then, you know, leave you for dead. Yeah, take your soul, buddy. Exactly, yeah. And then the deer men, I mean, fuck. That's just scary as shit. (laughs) That's a whole different monster. But then you have the other side of the coin of, you know, the the deer man from the moon. You know, they came down to help out and gave this guy these powers. And, you know, some of these deer women in different stories, they're actually signs of um, fertility. And they'll show up whenever someone's having a hard time, you know, having a child or maybe help somebody who's having a difficult pregnancy. So, boy, there's a lot in there. But I think... Beyond all else, just stay out of the fucking woods. Mm, Yeah. Well, buddy, that was a fun deep dive. And like I say, we could probably do a lot more research on them. Maybe we'll come back to it one of these days. Who knows? Well, for now, folks, if you're on the old Instagram, please give us a follow at at PXLParanormal. If you're on Facebook, please give us a follow and a like, The Pixelated Paranormal Podcast. If you're on Apple Podcast, iTunes, please give us a rating and a review. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know what you think. Preston, any news on the old YouTubers? No, we're still at 186. It's like... uh, No kidding. Yeah. Yeah, still stuck at 186. But... The episode 155, The Vertical Plane, is now up to 2,400 views. Gosh. 
Yeah. Who would have thought? Man, I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was either. And then if I go down to uh, the episode 70, Cryptid Encounters, all about Bigfoot, uh, 573 views. Yeah. Uh, it's raining men and I like it. Uh, goat men, frog men, and, uh, you know, dog men, 733 views. Uh, that one's gone up a little bit. So hell yeah. Uh, the awesome. cryptid encounters about gnomes that we did 140. Ooh, skeet skirt. Yeah, and then there was one more that I was going to point out the other day. Uh, missing 411, uh, 176 views. The Ozark Howler, 202. Uh, people seem to like that. And the Exorcism of Roland Dole, 201. The Zanfretta Abductions, 404, baby. Uh, oh, shit. Wow. Yeah, can't beat that. Uh, yeah, that's everything else is like 50. Um, your uh, was it Polybus? Uh, nineteen views. Uh, that that one was <laughs> that one wasn't a popular one. Uh, people aren't missing much on that one. That was one of our rowdy round tables that we got really out of hand. Yeah, and the the Mummy Mayhem busting a tut. <laughs> six views, <laughs> six views on that. So, but look, you know. Back on to the good stuff. If you need a beard, if you want a beard, hell, if you're a deer man out in the woods and you're looking a little crusty <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're trying to get your uh, built like a brick shit house fatigue back up and uh, you just want to glisten like Arnold Schwarzenegger, then, you know what, you should do yourself a favor and go over to BigDobsBeardBomb.com and use promo code PXLPARA for 20% off your order and pick yourself up some scents like Bay Rum, Sweet Tobacco, Fresh Citrus, Dundee Cedar, Classic, Mint, Barrel Aged, and uh, you know what, you'll be the best goddamn smelling and looking dear man, dear person, dear thing out in the woods. <laughs> you know, maybe you got some new ink, uh, you know, you got a little deer ink on you. Dobbs has got tattoo uh, balm now. Uh, get it all at Dobbs. Dobbs is the man. Hell yeah, man. He's cranking out some pretty great stuff there. That is for sure. I think I should mention, too, here on the old Instagram, um, those numbers are just steadily climbing. We're 618 followers, so that has continued to grow pretty darn quick, so we do appreciate that support as well. All right, and if you're in the Wichita area, please stop by and see our dear, dear friend Leslie and the rest of the gang at CD Trade Post, Pawnee, and Seneca. They uh, they posted on Facebook the other day their new haul of SNS, uh, SNES games, NES games, Sega games, PlayStation games. Um, so you're in the Wichita area. Go check that shit out. I saw uh, Castlevania II Simon's Quest uh, on that post. So, No oh, shit. Yeah. Oldie but a goodie. All right. And so next time, Preston, we're going to get a little gnomey, huh? Tales oh, yeah. Tales of gnome encounters in the woods. That's yeah. not the first or second time we've talked about them, but I'm anxious to see what you've got cooking in the yeah. meantime. I'm going to do a little dive into goblin-proofing one's chicken coop and other practical advice in our campaign against the fairy kingdom. I picked up this book not too long ago written by Reginald Bakley. And it should have some stuff in there you guys can use to make sure that your houses don't get overrun with gnomes. That's right, because you know them all about it. <laughs> all right, folks. Till next time, cheers to the weird shit in the world and those of us that love to talk about it. And stay spooky and stay on the paranormal highway. The cast that Pixelated Paranormal would like to thank you for listening to this week's episode. Pixelated Paranormal is here to tell you tales of the fantastical, the strange, the unknown. Tales that will move you a little further down the paranormal highway. If you'd like to share your own listener story, we would love to hear it. Email us at pixelatedparanormal at gmail.com. Again, that's pixelatedparanormal at gmail.com. We'd really love to hear from you. Again, thanks for listening to this week's episode of Pixelated Paranormal your guide to the unusual and the strange.